Well, here it is. It's a, a sunny London day, which in itself is a novelty, uh, although it is begin about to be June. And I'm sitting it, not too far from the BBC in London with uh, Hamish Stewart. Now, for those people who know their music will know who Hamish Stewart is. However, for those unenlightened who may be listening, <laughs> Hamish Stewart is, of course, one of the primary key members of Average White Band. And Average White Band, of course, uh, my first memories of Average White Band, to be honest with you, Hamish, come, uh, 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 actually listening in 1974, I went to New York on holiday, at the invitation of my former flatmate in London. And I don't know where we were, I think we were somewhere in Brooklyn. Uh, and I, all I remember is uh, hearing pick up the pieces on the radio. Uh -huh. And I said, who's that? <laughs> He says, the average white band. I said, average white band, were they? <laughs> now, bear in mind, I was just visiting from London. You'd think I'd have already known, but anyway. Yeah. So that's how long I've known who Henry Stewart is. So for the benefit of those who are going to be listening on soulmusic.com, just let's, let's, I know that the, the occasion for us meeting today and having this conversation is the release of um, Average White Band Gold, yeah. which is a three CD, two vinyl LP set. Um, the first thing I want to ask you um, is, is, did you expect, do you have any idea that the music you made all those decades ago <laughs> would, would still be something that people would in, listen to, enjoy, obviously sample a lot of? Yeah, who'd have thunk it? You yeah. Know, yeah. The, I, I think about that quite often, actually, uh, when, when I, I think about how we, how we wrote those songs and tunes like pick up the pieces we were living in a in a house in hollywood north hollywood up up in the hills with blankets over the windows <laughs> living in each other's pockets you know like putting the cassette of the previous day's work on while we were having our toast and tea in the morning <laughs> in fact that's got the love the chorus came up mm. i just suddenly started to sing the chorus wow. as we were listening to it but pick up the pieces was an after a jam one afternoon, mm. uh, and Roger Ball went away. To st he was staying with his girlfriend, uh, so he left us at the end of the day, and he came back the next day with the horn line, and we put from there we put the tune together, and you just don't think you know when you, we I mean we had nothing, mm. we had nothing back then. Uh, you just don't you don't imagine what's going to happen. Well, because this is this yeah. that's forty five years later, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, I think for for any of any of us who've been around long enough, it's still quite astounding that music that we listen, in some cases, listen to or made, is you know people are uh, there are people discovering it for the first time. Yeah, I mean, even like the fact that. That there's a, a vinyl two CD, two two vinyl <laughs> LP release yeah. must. I mean, I, I just want to get your reaction to the fact that part of what you're doing with this is actually putting it out as two LPs. Yeah. I mean, is that kind of like completely mind blowing? Absolutely. I mean, I ne never thought that vinyl would come back the way it has. You know, it's it's been an extraordinary development over the last few years just watching that starting to happen again i mean i never thought i'd see another gatefold <laughs> <laughs> well you, the, we, we've got to educate some people they don't know, yeah. they don't know what a gatefold oh, yeah, is yeah. yes yeah. a gatefold there's, is there's, there's <laughs> two album two album packet well it's like two records stuck together two right. vinyl records stuck together so, so let me ask you a question i mean it's kind of relevant to 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 the vinyl, well, it's relevant to the fact there's a whole generation discovering vinyl, so to speak. Yeah. And in the process, discovering music that they didn't grow up with. Yeah. Because they weren't even thought of, probably. Even yeah. the, well, I know they weren't, given yeah. the ages that they would be. Um, to, to what do you attribute um, the fact that you can put out two LPs, um, you know, of classic music, really classic classic grooves, classic funk, classic great songs. I mean, great songs that uh, that have really stood the test of time. What, what do you think it is that this whole generation, another generation is finding it as if it's new? Um, I, I really, I really don't know. Uh, I, I mean, 
this is so. Uh, who would have thought that vinyl would come back right. as big as it has? And uh, I, I, I don't know. I think it must. A lot of people were introduced to our music yeah. through hip hop. Yes. Through the sampling that was yes. done and stuff like that. People. Uh, um, and I did see a, a, a thing recently, somebody sent me a clip where a guy was uh, listening to the original version of Schoolboy Crush. Okay. And he's going, he's grooving along with yeah. it and said, oh, they must have sped this up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then he, and then he starts to rap and, and he's going, who's singing? What's this? Wow. What's it? Uh, and obviously he was relating to the Eric B and Rakim version sample. Yeah, but, sample. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he thought at <laughs> one point he said, "Well, who are these guys? You can't mess with a classic." <laughs> wow. Well, that's <laughs> true, but not in the way he meant it. Yeah, but yeah. I, 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 wow. Uh, just like that is wonderful. Funny. Right? That's funny. I guess he then went back and mm. and discovered the original. Yes. Yes. But uh, yeah, who knows how. how the cosmic mystery of how music yeah. survives and go through so many different issues. And, and the great thing is that it does. Yeah. That it, that it actually does. And that, that it, it, it um, you know, the, I think about the, we, we talk about pick up the pieces, but obviously I know there have been many albums and, and great tracks. And so one of my favorites, forever favorites, I moved to New York in 1975. But one, so one of my absolute favorite uh, AWB tracks is A Love of Your Own. Oh, I mean, yeah, I just yeah. still, I just think that's like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, just even, you know, listen to it now, it sounds as, as, as amazing as it did then. So I want to ask you, as the person singing on that track, and on many of the other classic yeah. vocals of, of, of AWB, um, what, who would, would you say informed your vocal style? I mean, in other words, you know, uh, for those who really have, know your history, know the history of, of, of Average White Band, know that you did an album in 1973 on MCA, which wasn't that well known or well yeah. received at the time. And then, as you mentioned, you know, moving to, to Los Angeles, signing with Atlantic, and then all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, well, yeah, I guess in a sense, all of a sudden, here you are. It did move pretty yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so who, before all that, were you listening to that really, as I said, informed how you sang, or the who we, who yeah who we, I easily said who influences <laughs> everybody. Okay, I mean James Brown, Marvin, Donny Hathaway, uh, and and everybody that had gone before. You mm. know Otis and Sam and Dave and yeah. all the stacks, all the Motown things, um, and and what was happening at that time. All the funk bands that were happening at that time in the 70s as well. Plus, groups like the Spinners and the OJs were big influence. But I, I, on A Love of Your Own, I kind of, I had the Isley Brothers in my mind. Really? Yeah, well that, I can, I can get that. I can there's that, 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 Because yeah. there's, some, there's some wonderful, uh, like the, the version of It's Too Late by the Isleys on the Brother, Brother, Brother album. It's just fantastic. And mm -hmm. it, I wanted some of that kind of flavor mm. in it but the song was was something that just popped out it was it was I, I wrote it with a friend of mine Ned Doheny mm -hmm. who Ned and I had become friends we just we met at my girlfriend's house mm -hmm. and uh, we started hanging out together you know and we'd go out and tear the town up and <laughs> and when say we'd AWB had finished a tour and I'd be in LA, I'd go and stay at Ned's house for a few days and we'd go and hang out. And one night we got back to his house and we'd sitting around the kitchen invariably with a couple of guitars. Mm. And that song just popped out wow. in half an hour and we we kind of had a cassette player running. As, as we all did back I, then. I, yeah. <laughs> and, and we didn't think anything about it and, and we were having breakfast the next morning and, and we were listening to it and she said, that's not bad. That's, that's, that's really quite, we weren't, we yeah. weren't deluded and drunk. <laughs> okay. So, right. that, that, so that's, that's yeah. where the song came from. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm glad 
that you enjoy it as much. Oh, absolutely. It means, it means a lot to me. And yeah. for, for, what it, for what it is, it's one of those magical moments that happened where that song just kind of popped out. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the best, uh, for me, it's in the handful of the five best things I've ever been involved really? in. Really? Wow, interesting. Interesting. I mean, yeah. Well, I'm interesting because I mean that was my first like you know of the of the of the of the recordings. That's probably the one that I mean the first time I heard it. I I, I was in I was in New York for sure. I can't remember where I was living now. And it came on the radio. I, I, wherever <laughs> however I heard it, I was like, whoa, yeah. But I, I want to ask. I want to go back a little bit before that. Just on a little bit yeah. before that too. You know, I know you grew up in Dundee. Am I correct? Or did you grow up in Dundee? No, I grew up in Glasgow. I oh, you grew up in Glasgow. Myself and Oni, the other guitar player. Okay, we gotcha. were the Glasgow guitars. Okay. Yeah. And then where, um, I mean, you mentioned a lot of, of the influence, like Otis, Sam and Dave, and yeah. then, you know, James Brown, and then other people. I mean, how did you hear that music back then? I mean, well, what access did you have to it? Because that would have probably been, I'm thinking, like the late 60s. Well, really, really through the clubs. When I, when I, I was still at school mm -hmm. and I joined a kind of semi-pro band mm -hmm. uh, and we started playing all over the place and we'd play the clubs and the, the, the main club in Glasgow at that time that went late was a place called the Picasso and all the mm -hmm. bands went to play there okay. and there was a great DJ there so he was leathering, you know, all that music. All the Liberty stuff, Lee Dorsey, and wow. you know, okay, of course, all the stacks, yeah, all yeah, Motown, yeah. everything. It, so it was all there. Yes. Um, and we were exposed to that. And then in '67, uh, the Stacks Review came to Glasgow, mm -hmm. and I saw them at the Locarno Ballroom in Sucky Hall Street, and it was heaving with people, and it was the most wow. amazing show. You had everybody, yeah. uh, Arthur Connolly, Sam and yeah. Dave, yeah. Eddie Floyd, uh, Booker T and the MGs, the, the Memphis Hall, it was and, like, yeah, it was, and Otis, and Otis, Otis yeah, yeah. as uh, the, the capper, you know, yeah. was like, wow, it's still in, in my top five yeah. shows I've ever seen, yeah. it, it was really well, a, I, I, a sensation. I, I didn't see them in, in Scotland, I saw them at the... Fairfield Hall was in Croydon, because yeah. although I lived in London, I for some, some reason didn't see them when they played in Fins at Finsbury Park, I don't know why, but I did see them uh, at, at Fairfield Hall was in Croydon. So I, I, I have a similar memory in a different setting. And it was just like, I tried to explain to people what that yeah, was like. Yeah. And it, it was, was really electric. hard yeah. because I had nothing to reference. I had nothing at that time. There was no, re what else could you reference? I mean, there was no other show like that. Yeah, well, it wasn't just they hadn't a pickup road band. Right. They had the guys that played right. on all the records: right. Al Jackson, Steve Cropper, yeah, yeah. Duck Dunn, and and Booker T. Uh, Booker T. Yeah, yeah, and it was yeah. like, yeah, it was everything. So, so you were funk. You were you were a funky guy from 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 <laughs> e from even then. You, you, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love uh, that. That that changed my life. That wow. Night. Really? Yeah. That concert? Oh yeah. Wow, that was like a defining moment. Like Ab okay. absolutely, really, absolutely. It was. It, it, it just I I never seen or heard anything like it. You know, you hear like oh, you'd see people on television, sure. and maybe Ready Steady Go or yeah, something like that. But yeah. to witness that level of soul music uh, yeah. uh, in in the flesh in front so, of you, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sam and Dave were amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, what I remember particularly sure, uh, about that was that, um, um, I, well, I don't remember it at the time, but I remember in retrospect, uh, Otis Redding, after, after he did that show with them, it, how he did the European tour with them, he never wanted to be on a show with them again because they set, because the way, that, because their career, I mean, the whole, like their, that call and response thing and the whole, yeah. you know, their whole interaction. I mean, because nobody knew they hated each other, but that's besides the point. <laughs> but, you know, the fact is that, you know, uh, they were like, we know, I know, no, no one had ever seen anything like that, really. No, no, and he no, was no. like, oh, don't, don't put me on any more shows with Sam and Dave. 
because because he had to really work hard even though he was the headliner you know yeah yeah they would just they left people i mean as you know and i know it was you you don't know like i know yeah, sometimes <laughs> okay, idea. Well, hey. sorry, it's on Hamish. you don't like anyway um too late uh, yeah too late <laughs> i think someone's already done it maybe a little group called sam and dave anyway uh, i was gonna ask you so to kind of fast forward you know somewhat um so when you got to, you were in America, you get the deal with Atlantic you yeah. know, in Los Angeles. At the time when that happened, did you have, at that, again, I'm going to ask you, a, did you have any idea question? What did you, what, as a, yourself and the members of the group, what, did, what was your expectation of what would happen after you did the first album for Atlantic? What did you think was likely to happen? Well, we, 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 didn't, we didn't realize what we were getting ourselves into. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we, we, we went, we did the, uh, the second album for uh, MCA and we took it to Artie Mogul. Artie yeah. Mogul, who was the head of the company, yeah. and we played it to him and he said, um, I don't know what to do with this, guys. Take your tapes, you're free to go. Wow. And we knew that Wexler was in town and right. we knew where he was. So we took it to him and three weeks later we were in Miami with wow. uh, at Criteria and we walk in and there's Aretha at the piano. Oh, okay, hold on. Okay. Cornel Dupree, Richard T, Chuck Rainey and Purdy and Hugh McCracken in the studio. Jerry Wexler, Arif Marden and Tommy Dowd. And they're just finishing up this Aretha session. And we, we're spending the next two days in the studio with them to decide who's going to produce us. <laughs> and three weeks later, or a couple of weeks later we're in new york starting right. recording the album mm. i mean we didn't imagine that we're in this room that with <laughs> yeah, yeah with these guys uh, where history has been made and that was just the beginning mm. and wexler was great he yeah. really he, he really believed in us yeah. and he went all the way with it when when it needed more when he felt the record was just about getting there needed more promotion he signed off on it Mm. And then we had a reef in our corner in the studio. It was, yeah, he, we died he, and gone to heaven. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, he. I, I mean, I still consider that, um, you know, a reef Martin is one of the. Even though I mean, people, people in music know who he is, and of course, you know, anyone who's really listened and checked credits on music knows who he, who he, who he is was. Um, I still think he's one of the unsung heroes. Oh. I mean, he's just as a music, I mean, as an arranger, yeah. conductor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not just. I mean, I had the privilege of, of meeting him a few times and having conversations with him, and it just was. Just, it, it just. I mean, I just think it's one of those kind of not a tragedy, but in a sense, you know, some people because the personalities don't, don't, don't. They just say, "Let my work speak for itself." Yeah. The downside of that is, unfortunately, that means sometimes that they, they, the full extent of what they contribute doesn't get recognised. Yeah. He, he was one of the last great record producers, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And, and he had, I mean, he did all, well, on, on the album, mm -hmm. on, uh, on this collection, mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm happy to say that the whole version of uh, Star in the Ghetto was on there, because yeah. the Reef's arrangement his strings and horns are, are phenomenal. And that's just one of the things in his arsenal that Ahmet Erdogan used to talk about was the Reef was the producer arranger, yeah. arranger producer. So he could, yeah. and, and he could, he could pack uh, a record with so much in terms of arrangement, but he never, he never overdid it. Yeah. Like he did some really big productions on Carly Simon records and Bette Midler records, but then he produced Nora Jones, mm -hmm. and there were no strings, there were no horns. He he just knew what was right yeah. for the artist. Yeah, yeah. So you actually got to be in the studio with a reef, and 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 am I correct that he produced uh, all of your Atlantic, all the average white band Atlantic albums? Um, all but feel no fret okay feel no fret we we did with gene paul we wanted to test the waters ourselves yeah. we wanted to pre produce ourselves and we got back to doing a different kind of kind of thing i mean uh, that, that i think that is one of our one of our best records but i mean uh, having said that 
I continued to work with Reef right through that that mm. period, and that's when we started doing the the Shaka. Yeah, when he produced Shaka's first solo record, myself yeah. and Steve Ferroni played on it, and mm -hmm. and the next two albums. Uh, so, and and Reef would call me in to do stuff, and I I just I feel so lucky to have been in his orbit. Yeah, you know, and to have been a part of so many great things that he pulled me into. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, apart from all the stuff that we did with AWB. Yes. He was a wonderful, a wonderful man, a wonderful human being and a great musician. Yes. And a great friend. Uh, yeah. I think it's very, uh, my experience of him, which were limited, not anything along the same scale of you actually work with him day in and day out. But I always found him very gentle, like very kind of... Yeah. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, I, and it, yeah. I did a, Steve Ferroni and Molly Duncan and myself did a record together mm. about three years ago. Mm. Uh, and we sat, Steve and I sat down in the back of the control room after we did the first take. And I said, well, this, this is just like the old days. This is great. Because we, we, it was the band in the studio, yeah, everybody yeah. live. Yeah. And so the, the only thing that's missing is a reef. Wow, wow. wow. We, we miss him. Yeah, I gotcha. Well, he played obviously a pivotal role in yeah, what you yeah. all did.